No Tinker, oh shit. No dice friends this week, but in its place, Tinker Taylor Solder Fry. Welcome to Tinker Taylor Solder Fry here on the Mighty Loading Ready Live Video Entertainment Network. I'm Ian. I'm Cameron. And that sure happened. Boy, get ready for seeing that again during the stream highlights at the end of the week. I'm yeah. glad we recorded that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I, I was here. I was expecting the thing that I dreaded. The thing I was most dreading to see in the stream highlights was me getting blown away by Bob mm. on Magic the other day. But no, that one's going to be beautiful. <laughs> So yeah, as uh, Beach stated, there is uh, no dice friends today mm -hmm. because uh... Uh, because well, um, Graham, Serge, and Ben are returning from PAX South. Mm -hmm. um, they left early this morning and have encountered multiple delays. Mm. Uh, apparently, based around Utah. Wait, the, the delays themselves were based around Utah, or I, the delays were in Utah? I, I assume it was one of those cascading failures okay. where a few minute delay at one airport uh, has rippling effects outward that affect every everywhere on Earth fairly soon. Because I do like being able to like give the uh, what is it square the blame directly on one state. Oh, in I assume its entirety. I assume we're looking at broad system failures here. Mm. Sorry about that. We now rejoin Tinker Taylor Solder Fry, already in progress. Hey, we're back! We are! Well, hey. well, welcome back once again for the second time today to Tinker Taylor Solder Fry, where we're doing catch-up on projects. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've, I've had these miniatures in the pipe for like two years now. Oh, I've um, got so many things to do. I mean... Which is not bad, all things considered. I have Rogue Trader miniatures that are still unpainted. Ooh, wait, Rogue Trader? Yeah, that is from uh, early 90s. Ooh. That was the first name for Warhammer 40k. Really? Yeah, it was Rogue Trader. Huh. And you're now reminding me of Rogue Trooper and how much I enjoyed that one comic book I had of it back in the 80s. But... Mm. Did you know that Games Workshop has partnered with Funko Pop to make miniatures? Boop. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Finally, finally, yeah, finally, there will be affordable Warhammer 40k miniatures. <laughs> okay. With good anatomy. <laughs> yep. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'm glad Games Workshop has finally found someone to produce collectible miniatures. I, yeah, I guess so, because they're... they're uh... I mean, they won't go out of business anytime soon? Uh, I assume what happened is that Funko probably, like, drove a dump truck of money up to Games Workshop and is like, hey, can we license you? Yeah. And Games Workshop probably was like, okay, what? Sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have a bot at this point to just go out and try and, and, and do the cold calls for new new marketing. Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, I, I actually I actually looked up the, uh, the going rate for that. Remember a while back in... Uh, when were you live when we made those boats to go oh, across yeah, the yeah, backlog? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I stuck a Funko Pop on the back of that of Moriarty from Sherlock. Yeah. Yeah, that apparently the going rate for that particular pop is 35 bucks right now. But why? I don't know. It was in the dollar store. I assumed oh. it was in garbage. That's why they put things in dollar stores. <laughs> did it, Where did it go? <laughs> I, I'm assuming the bottom of the duck pond. Oh, fair enough. Well... <laughs> Yep. That's a that that's a meal out. <laughs> yeah. So today I guess I'm going to be uh, working on a number of projects here. I'm actually going to start off with a commission I've been working on for someone. Oh. Who wanted a copy of the Desert Bus button that was non-functional. So that's going to be easy. I managed to get things printed off and we'll just do the final soldering of that today. Mm. Uh, then maybe we'll get around to some stitching, but I've also got this pile of dead Ethernet cables which needs to be made into... Wait, not Ethernet. Pile of very bad Ethernet cables. <laughs> yeah, these are awful. Well, they're 10 yeah. base 2. Oh, wait, no, fuck, they're XLR. 10 base 3? Sorry, 10 base 3, yeah, why not? 
Yeah, the, we we tried like we plugged them in and we tried they to didn't like, even fit. put the plugs. They... The right, yeah, the plugs were wrong and then nothing came over the cable. So there's something clearly wrong with. I, them. I see people making jokes in the chat there. I but I, I have seen XLR over Ethernet as mm -hmm. a thing. Oh yeah, and it's uh... it's Ethernet over XLR. That's the hard one. Yeah, I mean if you went with uh, what was it Finnet mm. the, uh, the the coaxial version. It would probably work out okay. Yeah, like, uh, what, 10 base 2 or whatever. Yeah. What is the throughput of, of XLR? Uh, probably not that bad, actually. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, like, uh, DMX is a digital signal that's being sent around. Right. So there is, a, like, there is a baud rate on it or a throughput. Like, coaxial probably had to have a reasonable throughput to send, vi like, vi video in real time you could get, and audio. Well, right? back in the day, you could get uh, you could get at least 100 base T. Right. Or, yeah, 100... I, I mean, you know, like, I mean, uh, uh, SDI cable is effectively still just coaxial cable. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, you know, 12G SDI can broadcast 4K video. Interesting. Can send 4K video. So, you know, it's, uh, I think that in terms of, what, what I like about coaxial cable is that it's just, you know, it is literally just a cable. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, uh, all they have to do is, you know, uh, uh, it's just, it's most of the actual, like, smarts and stuff that's been upgraded is the stuff on either end. <laughs> right, doing the encoding and the, yeah. yeah. The actual cable itself hasn't really changed much over the years. Hello. Hello. I think, uh, that? what is it? That is amazing, Beach. Thank you so much. I thought I was, oh, okay, good. Everything is okay over here. You're, you're not going slowly blind? Yeah. Eyes are dim, I cannot see. I have not brought my specs with me. I have not brought my flex with me. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. <laughs> Some of those schoolyard rhymes may not be appropriate for this current. <laughs> yeah, as I, was, as I was seeing that, I was like, I hope there's not a mega racist verse in here that I'm not aware of. I never really got that song, like. I, I don't even. I didn't bring like my eyes are dim. I cannot see. I have not brought my specs with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you didn't bring your glasses. Yeah. yeah. So what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The quarter. Yeah, and I don't know how I know that. I must have paid vague attention to those lyrics at one point. Were you ever in Scouts? Yes. Scouts? Yeah. Yeah. It's probably where you heard it. Probably. Popular it's a popular it's a camp song because mm -hmm. it was on it was in the 4h too mm -hmm. what are the 4h's head heart health and hand really yeah i thought it was about like you know horticulture husbandry oh yeah no no it's, it's uh, I, like i assume those were the 4h's yeah, it's Horse it's girls. it's actually yeah. just about being a uh because it's not actually an art architectural <laughs> just not not uh solely a uh agricultural, agricultural. Oh, okay. Yeah, the 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 initial clubs that I got into were uh, small engine repair mm -hmm. and photography. Really? But I am led to believe that some of the other some of the 4-H clubs in cities and the larger centers had things like model rocketry as an option. Really? That's yeah. basically basically the idea is you're you're training youths to be uh, actually beach. skeptics. That's really great what you're doing there because. I can see the screen far more clearly than I can see the miniature. <laughs> so we just need two sets of USB uh, I have my, I might need new glasses. My eyes are dim. I cannot see. I might be going blind. That's disconcerting. Mm. Very. Okay. Like how I was wearing the wrong contact lenses in my eyes for, like I had them swapped for like weeks. Oh yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. I thought it was months. Turned out I think I just did it during Desert Bus. I got home and was confused. Uh. All right. Well, it looks like one of these projects I'm not going to get much done on because I'm missing the wiring. But that's okay. This would have been a quick one where we can get right into the XLR stuff. So well, it's an impromptu so, stream. So, so somebody so. wanted a non-functional... Like just a case. Well, they wanted a they they, they wanted a replica of the button. Ah, I see. And I figured that yeah, that's you know we, we we can do a full version that has the full functionality that you'd have to get in there and configure it yourself too. 
and mm. execute whatever, or we can just do a, uh, a non-functional one that just lights up. And you're like, I, yeah, you know what? The light up sounds just fine. Something about it's like this is not an actual. This is not a button. It's a <laughs> it's a replica of a button. It's like, yeah, but it, it's still a button, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's 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 like a uh, it's like a, a, a replica pistol. I mean, we're we're getting into some deep epistemology here. <laughs> when is a button not a button? Much like much like a replica pistol, you don't necessarily want the uh, the trigger. To, you want to be able to pull the trigger to get that fun feeling of hey, I just pulled the trigger. Mm. But you don't want that gun to go off. Mm. You know, when you're when you're sitting in your your home, comfortable at night, you might want to push a button. And pretend that you're about to have a random dance party, mm -hmm. but not actually inst instigate one. You want to just dry fire the yeah. button. Yeah. So we'll remove the, the pin from things. All right, let's start with this little guy. That's, I mean, the real trick in terms of glasses is if, if when you get like, if when you do get new glasses, you're like, oh, hey, the trees have different leaves on them. <laughs> they aren't just masses of green. That's cool. Let me know if you see everything start to say obey. Yeah, that's that's you're you're at the wrong kind of glasses then. <laughs> oh no. Or maybe the very right kind of glasses. Yeah. Uh but the other one the actually the, the evaluation I usually use for when I should probably look at getting new glasses is uh the bus uh like the bus name name. Ah, uh, yes. Like how far away I can see when mm. I know what, what bus it is. Mm. I remember going in for a vision test when I was very small and the optometrist asked me to read the smallest line I could see. And I started reading letters and my mother started to panic because she was like, he either is illiterate or blind. <laughs> and the optometrist was like, all right, nailed it. You have perfect, vi you have like 30 over 20 vision. And she was like, there's a line down there. <laughs> It's copyright 1902. Yeah. CV White and Brothers. Yeah. Yeah, that was a Looney Tunes gag, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. The whole reason I have glasses, other than the fact that I've always liked them aesthetically, is uh, the same reason you brought up, Paul, for getting your prescription changed. It was while living in Japan, I realized, wow, I can't actually read what's on the bus indicator at the front mm. it's a lot harder when you've actually got uh, kanji that you need to read oh, oh yeah. yeah i can yeah. imagine they're very detailed yeah it, it, one one tiny line can make all the difference between here's where your classroom is and the outside of town well and it's <laughs> but it's an interesting thing because it's like in your day-to-day -day life uh there isn't that many situations where you're trying to read text that's very far away from you mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the nice thing about a bus is that it's text that's very far away and then gets closer. So you have a very easy, like, can't read, can't read, can't read. Oh, I can read it now. Mm -hmm. I used to be able to do that one block backward and back. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that it's kind of like, um, you know, those quiz games where it starts giving you more hints, but your points go down. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, now I can read it. Bye. <laughs> There's two of them. Hmm. Okay, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. so we're going to have to get through all three of you guys. It's only the ground pin. So, I mean, if I recall, the problem with most of these is, you know, very sort of intermittent type connections. So, yeah. the real trick is figuring out when you bend it, where, well, where the break is, <laughs> I guess. I think honestly, the uh, the what I'm going to be trying here is just chop them off a couple inches out in, and then test the wires from there. Mm. Um, oh, for the person in chat who was asking, my um, the paints I'm using are these are Vallejo game color paint, and these are Vallejo model model color paints. Then I also have Games Workshop or Citadel paints of varying. Uh, uh, vintages. All the way up to stuff probably that's only about 10 years old now. Amazing that it's working though. 
Yeah. Right. Turns out liquids are fairly stable in uh, when they're sealed. <laughs> little bit of that insulator off. I, uh, I wound up drafting Magic the Gathering on my home stream today. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I put together a Rakdos deck, you know, the cult of Rakdos, the demon worshippers who run all the entertainment mm -hmm. on Ravnica, I now have uh, ICP's The Great Malenko stuck <laughs> in my head. <laughs> Which I suppose is a kind of justice. Was that just good background? So you're, you're trying to get into the spirit of the thing? Absolutely, yeah. I still love the scene in um, Steven Soderbergh's remake of uh, Solaris, where um, George Clooney's character arrives on the space station, and it's empty. There's supposed to be dozens of people there, and there's just no one, except for the very faint sound of music that he follows and finds um, Dr. Snow, who's played by... The actor who played Oppum in Saving Private Ryan, mm -hmm. Jeremy, You're something. You're the wrong person uh, for names. And he's listening to ICP's Riddle Box, just oh. cranked up, as like the only person in this solar system, or one of only two people in this entire solar system. And one of them's listening. And only one of them is not listening to ICP. Yeah. Is 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 that meant to illustrate how far things have fallen, or? Uh, no, he's just being very <laughs> quiet. I think. And he's like, eh, you know, you know what? Uh, also, Riddle Box, I guess, has some thematic relationship hmm. to the film. Hmm. In that, um, Riddle Box is about is a concept album because, as it turns out, ICP are actually very Christian. Interesting. And the entire Dark Carnival concept was a uh, a backdoor uh, missionary thing. Really? Yeah. Okay. He, yeah. He, I I feel like I'm being shit on here, so. <laughs> Or not shit on, but... Gaslit? Yes, thank you, that's it. Nope. Wow. I mean, at least last time I heard anything about it, this was the God's honest truth, ironically used, I suppose. But <laughs> Riddle Box is about what happens after you die. Hmm. Stripping wires. Yes, Papa. <laughs> Telling lies. No, Papa. Open your jaws. <laughs> now bite down on the insulator, but don't crimp the wire. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Bruising the gin again, Johnny. <laughs> Open the mixer. So... Who's, uh, uh, so who's this you're painting now, Cam? Uh, this is a, a dark weaver, no, that's something else. Uh, this is an elven kind of melee DPS character, I want to say. It's almost like a harlequin or something. Yeah, only this one has, like, a uh, flayed skin as a cloak and is dressed like he's going to a Nine Inch Nails concert. I'd say around pretty hate machine era. I've, I'm pretty sure I've, I've been bumped into by this man in a, in a mosh pit and just like left with a sweat stain. <laughs> yeah. This this would be called uh Tenebriel shard, yes. This would be called inappropriate mosh pit attire, I think. Yeah. I like I I I'd like to see maybe uh 60% less spikes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I had a friend who went into the mosh pit at uh, Nine Inch Nails on the Fragility Tour in, what, like six, no, four inch heels? Huh. How'd Steph they do? She came out perfect. <laughs> Stephanie is a person of unique poise. Strong. She's exactly the kind of person who could, you, who you would hear that about and go, yeah, I'd believe it. All right, so I figured out what the problem was with this particular cable. Oh, yeah. The uh, pin two, or pin one, had just completely separated from the uh, the solder. Oh, well, that would do it. Yep, that's... That's, that's exactly what will do that sort of thing. 
Oh, there's a problem right there. I mean, I, nice, that's at least a sort of an obvious problem. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that due to us, I don't know, dropping the ends of the cable on the ground like 30 or 40 times a day? Oh, that would probably have nothing to do with this. Okay. They tend to not use, like, big blobs of solder, though, when they solder stuff, right? They oh, tend... they, I mean, if you want to get in here, there's a pretty big hunk. Oh, yeah. So this was the... Uh... This was the pin right here that came apart. And as you can see, big old glob of solder in there. Mm. It just, yeah. But it just somehow uh, disconnected cold. from the thing. Yeah. Like I a mean, cold bond maybe or something? or Maybe. I mean, we are pretty hard in our cables. So yeah. Yeah. I can... Uh, you know, I like to give them a good chewing on when nobody's looking. <laughs> well, I feel like they're, this... They're very squishy. I feel like this is one of those things where, where we go like... Huh, that's weird. I wonder when that could have happened. Yeah, smash and, cut to a montage yeah. of us just being like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, cut, cut us just... 50, 51, 52, 53. <laughs> it's like, what, what is... Was it... Uh, um, what was the show where, where it was like, I guess we're not getting our damage deposit back. And then cut to them playing like hammer darts. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a Malcolm in the Middle gag. It's like basketball. Wow, that movie did happen, didn't it? Yeah. Basketball? Yeah. I did enjoy, they had one solid gag where um, they do the psych outs at oh, yeah, tip off yeah. where they're facing off against one another and they try to like trash talk each other into um, failing. Mm -hmm. And one of them is notoriously bad at it. So he's got like his psych out line written on <laughs> his hand. <laughs> And he gets sweaty, and he's trying to read his psych out, and he says, Your mom's deaf. And the other player says, My mom is dead. <laughs> and he says, That would explain why she didn't move around very much. And it's just like, Oh, the layers. Sadness. For a, for a your mom joke. Yeah. I appreciate when they were able to surprise you like that. Yeah. It, I believe that movie is <laughs> also so... the the first and last time Trey Parker and Matt Stone have been acting in a movie that they didn't they didn't write that movie. Oh, really? really? Huh. I I'm pretty sure they contributed, but right. they are not they weren't the primary scriptwriters for it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And like it's puerile, yeah. but it got me. Mm. Right? Like it got me. My, the most memorable gag in that film for me was the, um, uh, where the, the I, I don't know if it was, a woman comes into the locker room when the two of them are having a conversation, and they turn to talk to her because they're wearing jock straps, and they have these, they have these giant prosthetic penises mm -hmm. that are, that are touching the floor. Like a Greek comedy. Yeah. No, if it was a Greek comedy, they would be uh, held up by... Uh rope yeah but this was like these giant penises that are touching the floor and like are like and have a few extra inches on the floor mm -hmm. right they're just way too big and it was like you knew that they wanted to do something to be like oh look at what big dicks that we have kind of deal like we want to brag about this but what would be even funnier is what if the dicks were comically large that doesn't make any sense that this would exist mm -hmm. and it was that it just caught me so off guard and i'm like i can't get the image of these comedy dicks like out of my brain. I can't even remember why it happened. I just know that it happened. I was like, I didn't expect that. Holy shit. Yeah. And you're like, why is this getting me? Yeah. I'm insulted that I'm laughing <laughs> at this. I feel like that could be one of those things where they they shot it like normally and, oh, yeah. and then just like can we do it like this? Yeah, that wasn't funny enough. Yeah, it's like, that seems really dumb. Yeah, I know, but let's try it. Let's just yeah. shoot it, and if it makes it makes us laugh, then... It's kind of how we do some things around here, too. Mm-hmm. Not, I mean, we haven't done that particular gag before, but... <laughs> yeah. Wow, do I need to be hotter than 300? Yes. I'm insulted that I'm laughing. My reaction... <laughs> I'm insulting that I'm laughing is my reaction to Blazing Saddles. What? <laughs> Blazing Saddles is genius. Nobody, nobody can write a sitting around the campfire eating beans joke like Mel Brooks. No. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Brooks. The, um... 
I, yeah, I remember my parents were like, oh, we should show you Blazing Saddles. It's really funny. And we watched Blazing Saddles and my parents were like, uh, 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 I don't remember this joke. <laughs> Ooh. Seven is hell of a drug. Yikes. <laughs> they had it on when we were in Grand Prairie and I just put it on because I wanted something to watch in the background kind of while we ate food at the hotel. And uh, Heather was telling me how her, they used to watch a lot of Westerns. She's like, I don't want to watch this. Like, I don't want to watch another Western. I'm like, it's Blazing Saddles. Like, it's, it's barely a Western. Right? It just, it kind of qualifies, but not really. And and she's like, no, I don't want to watch this because I've seen it multiple times. I'm like, why have you seen this movie multiple times? You do not strike me. She's like, well, because in our house, dad loved Westerns. And this was also the kind of Western that my mom was like, oh, it's Mel Brooks. It's funny. We'll sit down and we'll watch this. And so she'd seen it lots growing up. It was a movie that her parents could agree on. Yeah, it was one that the intersection was where the whole family would be watching it as opposed to like a, just a John Wayne movie or something like that. Right. So, yeah, it seemed interesting that that was like, that was a, this weird where everything kind of it, came it, together. Yeah, it was a point of consensus. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, yeah. Beach. I'm making your life I, very uh, difficult fine. here. That's, all, that's how that's the, that's my job. For some reason, I was thinking about it recently, and like I, I just, I think it was on Netflix or something, but I, I watched it recently. I, again, it's absolutely wonderful. But yeah, you know, assuming that you are, uh, assuming that you you know the context in which some of the language <laughs> is. Oh yeah, man. They bleeped a lot of stuff for TV. Uh, I like Mel Brooks says uh, uh, he the he brought in uh, uh, Richard Pryor to write for it, both because he's incredibly funny, and also to sort of uh, uh, bless bless the usage of certain words. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. I thought he was originally supposed to be in it too. I'm not sure. I thought that was the idea is that he would he was going to be the main character, and then they brought in this kid who had been unheard of before then and uh and yet it still went over very well just because gene wilder's in it and i just had this sense of like maybe this is supposed to be a prior wilder thing like what was the prior wilder vehicle they made well they did lots they did like um trading places see no evil here see no evil here no evil um, I think they did the one where they both go to jail. Wait, they did Trading Places before? Wait, no. Trading Places with Dan Aykroyd, I think. Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy did Trading Places. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Right. They did, they did a couple, like they were in about three or four movies together, I think. And they were just this, the hot duo of the time. Hmm. I was like, I said that, and I was like, no, I have that wrong. What am I thinking of? And like, what else was out during that time? I'm like, I think, because I was thinking of Brewster's Millions, which is just a Richard Pryor movie. It doesn't have Gene Wilder in it, I don't think, at all. Or the Dacroid. As he's known. Yeah. And if he's not known, he should be known. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Up there. Okay. Let's maybe use some fresh solder. God, I need to get a roll, or get or print a loop roll for this. Fresh solder. Yeah, good stuff. All right, I'm gonna move over to Ian. Okay, I'm yeah. I'm not sure I'm doing anything terribly interesting right now. This guy's pants are being troublesome. Oh, lots of smoke. Mm. Oh yeah, Richard Pryor's in. Superman 3. That's not, right. Not his finest work. That was a scary ass movie. It was a weird movie. Like there but there's a big there's big chunks of Superman 3 that are literally like Richard Pryor stand up. <laughs> like I think it was like the writer or the producer saw him do stand up and you know thought he was really funny, which he is. Mm -hmm. But then there's just like bits that are just his stand up <laughs> in the in the movie. Hey, Richard. They're just like he's a funny guy, make him do a funny thing. You want to do a set while we're here? You might no. use it. <laughs> yeah. Pile that is weird. Here. Best Mel Brooks movie. That's a tough one. Mm. I mean, Spaceballs? 
Spaceballs. Yeah. I mean, the, I, f- I feel like like Blazing Saddles, Spaceballs, and Men in, like Robin Hood mm. are sort of the trifecta. I really like History of the World personally. Mm. I have uh, I've I've only I think I've only seen that like once. But oh, and now Craggy's thing. I mean, it's one of those ones where you're like, you're like, this is the best. And then every time somebody suggests another movie, you're like, oh, right, that one. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that one, too. <laughs> I feel like yeah, I Young would... Frankenstein was fantastic as well. I have never seen it. We can no? all agree that uh, the you producers should. was better as a, as a stage play. It was very, very funny. Hmm. Young Frankenstein. Excellent. I've actually never seen all of the producers. I think I've seen... Um... I've seen the entirety of it in like clips and sections over time. Yeah. But I've never actually sat down and watched the producers. There was a modern version of it made. Uh, yeah. With Matthew Broderick, right. And Nathan Lane. Yeah. Well, the, and, and, um, Will Ferrell was in it too, actually. Will Ferrell. Really? Well, there, there was like a very modern version of it made. I think Broderick and Lane were, yeah, and Will Ferrell was the playwright. And they, uh, they, um, Mel Brooks also had that very, um, shotgun approach you know all those fast gags fast gags and you know highbrow lowbrow never met a joke he didn't like kind mm-hmm. of thing mm-hmm. right you got to dazzle them with just like numbers yeah yeah uh, density of comedy was important mm-hmm. there's actually i i have a really neat um there's a uh just a a, a special that he did with it's called like it's like an evening with Mel Brooks and Dick Cavett, mm-hmm. uh, and it's just this wonderful like it's literally just them like on stage, uh, sitting on stage telling old Hollywood stories, mm-hmm. uh, and they're both both just you know such great sort of raconteurs, huh. and have all these uh, you know stories about uh, uh, Mel Brooks has these great great stories about like Orson Welles and. Mm-hmm. Uh, different people because he did uh, when he did um, uh, let's see, he did high anxiety high anxiety yeah was not was it Orson no it wasn't it's um, yeah, it was Hitchcock Hitchcock yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a, a parody of a Hitchcock thing and, and uh, he was talking about how he like said it Hitchcock and then didn't hear anything and then a few a little while later received just like this giant uh, crate with like six magnums of really really expensive wine, huh. <laughs> and like like the flick or something. <laughs> That's but, cool. But yeah, both both of them uh, are very are one were sort of wonderful raconteurs, and so they were just basically like, you know, chilling and shooting the shit. That uh, sounds fun. And it's just kind of fun to watch them. I'll actually just click the Amazon on that one. These Amazon Basics have some very nice insulator sleeves on them. Too much solder on some of these pins. Mm. The problem is too much solder. 
Matthew Dennis, I am working today on uh, fixing a bunch of Lur's XLR cables. Because XLR is being a, a very used piece of kit end up getting damaged pretty easily. And are almost disposable, except for the fact that they cost money, <laughs> which makes them not disposable. Ah, that's are you okay? Very hot. Mm. Yep, fine. Okay. But just hot enough for me to notice. Mm. The, I mean, the, not only are uh, you know XLR cables, you know, do sometimes break and stuff, but also. In theory, they're of the various cables. They're one of the easier ones to fix, assuming that the fix is the end. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you if your HDMI cable is busted, it's kind of a whole uh, it's a whole thing. I will not be fixing anyone's HDMI cables. Yeah, yeah. Put that right out there right now. Or if your you know fiber optic cable is busted, then that could be a whole thing too. But. Uh, XLR isn't too bad. Add one more. There we go. And now twist that. Mm -hmm. And everything's in the right orientation. Now to just mate the two pieces. Hmm. What makes you explain the difference between XLR and HDMI. What makes XLR <laughs> so much different? I mean, fu fundamentally, uh, HDMI is what tw twenty? No, sixteen cables. It's pin compatible with DVI. So that's uh, three rows of nine. Says so that eighteen. Sorry, I fucked that up. Twenty-seven. Three rows. I think it's that. It's got to be at least that many. Too anyway, many. There's a a ton of little teeny weeny wires inside as opposed to uh, XLR, which is three wires. So more wires and skinnier wires make it very difficult. Mm. I think it's three of seven, so it's 21. And the tolerances are, uh, are make it are very small as well. Yeah. Good ugly joints. Mm. Oh, you're filthy. That's it. Hope you're enjoying our fetish stream. Look, they're the ones who keep ch chanting teeth. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> the S and ASMR does not stand for solder. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, crap. I'm sorry, mods. You, you said the word. I'm sorry. I can't wait for us this to is, actually it's, filter it, that. It's yeah. The, <laughs> is this the, it's the chat equivalent of, like, slime falling on your head when you say a thing. Yeah. <laughs> can, can like, we say oh, I said the grief? joke. <laughs> can we just open up another chat room on Twitch just to send all the teeth words to? It's the room of teeth, teeth, teeth. I'm so up. sorry to all our mods. Maybe we could write a bot that's just like, you get one teeth per 24-hour period. Use it wisely. Brush once a day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, twice a day, ideally, but... Or after meals. Mm -hmm. just, just, just brush. Yeah, what is... Okay, so ideally, it's brush when you get up. Not mm -hmm. like brush before breakfast, brush after breakfast, brush after your midday meal, mm -hmm. brush after dinner, brush before going to bed? I actually don't know. I feel like the prevailing opinions have changed over the years. But I, I just but know I get saying, yelled like, at by my dentist. Well, that's the thing. It's like, I'm not saying that it's like, what is the, you know, what is the proper amount to be brushing? What is the ideal like if it's like if you could if if it was Never like well, not you should, be brushing right it's like overbrushing is also a problem yeah exactly yeah. Well, what what yeah what are you trying to what what, what is the goal mm -hmm. 
Is that you're trying to keep stuff off your teeth because you know that it's eroding think, your teeth. I think laminating your teeth and then pre-chewing, all, have your food all, uh, you know, in, go through a blender so you just don't have to actually use your teeth at all. Just get replace it with one big curved tooth. Mm. I forget whose routine that was. Yeah, I got in trouble from my dentist a few years ago from overbrushing for over well using too too stiff a brush. Oh. Oh. It was that thing where it's like, hey, I feel my my mouth feels all like clean because I, you know, brushed it, but apparently I was uh, my gums were, you know, getting flensed annoyed mm. i had a good time with my hygienist because she looked in there and she's like you did you're doing great whatever you're doing keep doing it. and it's like that never happens Ooh. never happens yeah, yeah. but I've, I've been flossing only at night and i'm floss before i brush and um and she's like this is working for you finally because your gums aren't bleeding anywhere near as much mm. oh, okay now is i mean it floss before brush or bless, brush before floss there, okay, so I've heard floss before brush mm -hmm. because you use the floss to get everything out from your teeth and then you brush it away. Now, I heard oh. the opposite because that what, when you floss before brush, you're actually creating micro abrasions where you can work bacteria that you get off the teeth into your blood system. Oh, God. All One, I know is that when I go into the dentist and they like, the last time they floss, they pulled the floss through like they were trying to pull start a lawnmower <laughs> and were like, see, you're bleeding. <laughs> And I'm like, ah, yes, yes, I am. I've always done the floss after brushing, but now I realize that I just did that without questioning it. I haven't, uh, I haven't looked into it. It's two schools of thought, and and when I read the thing about flo uh, like brush after floss, like floss first, brush second, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, actually, it does make sense. If I have big food particles in my mouth, I want them to be out from my teeth and picked up by the surfactant and, you know, washed away. I just, I just gargle with vinegar for four or five minutes every day. <laughs> you know, Add in some hydrogen peroxide and then get in there with steel wool. A little bit of kerosene, light a match, we're good. I used to use a small fresh willow stick, but then I just figured, you know, why bother? And I've been using a, a piece of charcoal just to blacken everything. Yeah, yeah. I found uh, my, my best oral health routine was just uh, taking Tylenol 3s. Mm, yeah, there we go. <laughs> and lots and lots and lots of white strips. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, eating white strips all day like, like nori flakes. <laughs> it's like Gargle a car wash. And peroxide and... It's like a car wash for your mouth. <laughs> I can't use white strips. My teeth burn. Ew. The, the, the enamel, I think... That's is, how you know that it's working. Right? Yeah, right. it's like getting a perm for your mouth. The, the, uh, yeah, it's, you're putting hydrogen peroxide on your teeth. Because how else do you think they whiten them? That's how they do it. And it sucks, because my enamel's weak, and it hurts. Heather has this stuff at home, uh, because she's in, uh, because she's just had uh, gum surgery. Um, it's called PerioGuard comes under different names as well but this was the colgate version of it it's chlorohexadrine something or other the okay. back of the label has the chemical diagram like the actual let's draw out all the all the uh, connections between all the different things oh that's really kind of cool it was and then it has the full name of it <laughs> which is about a line and a half long of, of six point text which that's, i tried reading that's what concerns me about them putting the diagram on there mm -hmm. is there's an, an implication that you will know what that means and be able to look at the diagram and be like, oh, no, this isn't the one I want. Right. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's clearly I for... wanted the one with a double bond on the oxygen. That's, yeah. That, this is entirely this is, this wrong. Is, this, this is, is going to be bad for me. This is too many rings of benzene. Like, I don't, I don't want information on the label of my medication... Uh, that, that I am in no position to evaluate whether it helps or not. <laughs> yeah, that you need a, at least a, an undergraduate degree to parse. Yeah, like if, if that's the kind of information that is needed in order to know whether the medication is safe, I should just not be taking that medication at all. This is, this is definitely a thing that um, it's, it's an antiseptic for the mouth. And um, I, was, 
uh, when I saw it, Cameron, I was very tempted to take a picture of it and say, Heather is putting this compound into her mouth. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens? You know what I'd do? <laughs> Send it to Julie? <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's fair. I mean, I'd probably be able to go like, oh yeah, you could do like a, a you know, you could do a, um, this a nucleophilic here. attack here and like, or, or something. Right, I'd be able to look at it and see like the reactivity points, and be able to kind of imagine what the spectrum would be like, and go like, oh, I don't, I don't know what's actually doing, right? I have the general education uh, around, around uh, what it does, but yeah, I wasn't like maybe not from a medical perspective, but more like, okay, where, what part did this? Because the chemical obviously has to break into other bits, mm -hmm. and I, it was more like, so what, what, what does this break into when you see it? Where, where do you see all the the parts where it actually uh, breaks apart. Ju was Julie says, don't send it to her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would look it up, yeah. right, and find out what the reactivity is and what it's what it's for. That is fair. Because, like, that, that was mainly the gist of my undergraduate education, was knowing how to uh, look for the information that I actually needed, right? It wasn't about um, memorizing different chemicals. It was about... Um, knowing how to look for it. Right. See, I feel like there's a few steps that are implied in that, though. Like, if I looked up what that chemical did, I would be like, okay, I can't right, actually yes. do anything with this information. <laughs> right, 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 yes. Yeah. It, yeah, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so I used to be like, so much better at explaining this. Like, if I, if I looked up all the specs for, like, a carburetor for a car... Mm -hmm. I'd be like, okay, now I know all the specs for this carburetor. Yep. I don't know how those affect what I want to do, but I know all the specs. Hmm. On the other hand, if I look up all the specs of, say, a video camera, I do know what those are for. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like Linux. You know, you, you can follow tutorials and have no idea what you're doing, <laughs> but still have something workable by the end of it. Well, yeah, like we as humans are able to do the following instructions without necessarily understanding how or why. Yep. The, the steps work, but we're able to do it, which is why games were, or, uh, Wizards of the Coast had to ban Crack Clan Ironworks today. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> Dunk! <laughs> Dunk on KCI players. Take, Out of nowhere. Take that, partners. So... Was that, that was Crark Clan? Yeah, I think so. Crark Clan Ironworks. Okay, because I, I had a thing on North 100 where Ben Wheeler was talking about something. Mm -hmm. and, and he mentioned Crark Clan whatever. And my brain just skidded to a halt. <laughs> yep. Because I was like, that wasn't even, and then he, they kept mispronouncing it. Everybody just kept mispronouncing it over and over, like in different ways, trying to like. Clark Clan. Yeah, trying to tell me, Beej, it's like this. You do it like, ah, uh, Christ. And he's like, okay, it's spelled. K A R no hang on K R K K R A K it's just this great yeah. moment of K R A R it's I I think it's actually um uh uh is it a palindrome yeah K R A R K yeah K R A R K God blast it incoming <laughs> well that's yeah I need to do an redo this entire end. I don't know mm. what happened. I got every one of the pins wrong. Like you put the wires on the wrong... Yeah, the wrong pins. Okay. Oh no. You made a, a XLR crossover cable? Yep. It's a good way to fry things. This is why you always test the cables when you're done. I like... Uh, there, there is that thing like uh, for... for mag Especially, you know, uh, if you're doing the... When we're doing the podcasts, the people on the set will uh, you know mention some card uh and there's certain magic cards that are very tricky to figure out how they're spelt just by hearing them said Kologon's command uh yeah and yeah i guess that ck thing can Mag take a yeah, while magic is bad for uh yeah they they'll you know they use lots of uh, alt say alternate spellings. Mm. Or sort of crew fix. Oof. My my favorite actually was uh, Revlark. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Because the problem with that is that it, it's a real like it's a real thing. 
Like mm -hmm. it's a real or not a real thing, but it's like a it's an, it's it's an a actual thing from mythology. It's a pre-existing thing or yeah. folklore that nobody knows how to spell. Right. So normally you can just like do a Google of what you can do and Google will auto complete it for you. But so many people have talked about Revel Arc while also spelling it incorrectly. <laughs> that no matter what version of the spelling you type into Google, you will find results. So it doesn't actually help you. <laughs> God, what was the other one that came up the other day where I was just like, this is impossible to figure out? Uh, oh well, I'm sure it'll come to me. It matters not. It doesn't mm. really, but it comes down to it. I might have one cable done by the time we're done this episode. I might have finished painting his pants. <laughs> That's actually significant. It's been an hour, boys. Did you want to... Oh my god, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, we fucked around for like... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we had to do the mouth thing. <laughs> <laughs> that took a good 30 minutes. To yeah. yeah, getting that set up... And... I'm worth it. At least flossing it, it seemed, beach. It seemed like it went on for half an hour anyway. <laughs> it may have been only 30 seconds. Are you guys just your keen the motor on through? Uh, we could take a quick break, yeah. I suppose. There's a pot of coffee in the other room that uh, needs 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 drinking. Well, let's take ourselves a quick little break here. We're going to make some uh, we're going to drink some coffee, grab some, you do the same back home, or empty mm -hmm. yourself out, fill yourself up, is whatever is Yeah, cycle your contents. <laughs> we'll see you on the other end of these uh, not-quite-commercials. Don't mm -hmm. go away. And that's why K-pop is so popular, is because it's made to cater for North American music tastes, whereas J-pop is still stuck in and perfecting the music of the 80s. I'm hey. sorry I wasn't listening. That's okay, I wasn't listening to yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just like, hey, you should say this. It would be really mean. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, let's do that. See, kids, that's how you do it. Welcome back to Tinker Tailor Solder Fry, bonus edition here on Loading Ready Run, and we are continuing <laughs> to paint mini figs, which is really... We are. And solder some XLR cables. We have one working XLR cable. It is now this long. I can. How, how much length did we lose in the? Uh, not much actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we got uh, there. We go. I can almost orc orc this and see both ends like a uh, sand person. I want to. Uh, when I think we're like you end up with like a six inch cable, just <laughs> like okay. But now now it definitely works. I mean, we we have use for six was, inch patch cables. All right, we do. Yeah. It's just like it was a ten foot cable, but we had to. We had, it, it, it was a process. Like, in terms of what we lost, I think it was about this much on each side, so maybe we lost half a foot. Hmm. That's hmm. not bad. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there's the other side. So, yeah, boom. We lost, yes, four inches. You see, I, I think the major problem we run into is that um, our XLR, the most common use for it is we put it at the bottom of the boom pole, mm -hmm. right, because we have a boom pole with an XLR LR jack in the inside instead of having to wind the XLR around yeah. the boom. Um, and then you're done booming. Because you're tired. And you put the boom down. <laughs> and the XLR cable goes. <laughs> well, see, that's why we bought some of these cables with the right angle adapter on the end of them. Right. And that one's broken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which end, though, will be interesting to find out. Who cares? Or if it broke in the middle. To be, to be honest, the main reason why we got the right angle, uh, originally, the reason why we got the right angle is Moonbase uh, Delta. So... Moonbase 4, mm -hmm. oh. the ceilings were so low mm -hmm. that uh, having, so they just making the, um, the, the cable coming out the back of the uh, microphone, doing, using a right angle one instead of a straight through one, uh, gave us another like two inches or so, <laughs> you know, that you could avoid because we always had problems mm. when you're booming from above, like bumping into the ceiling. Uh, well, we may want to reconsider wrapping the cable portion with uh, like with gaff tape because Those... there is something that is in the cable. It's the rubber that's reacting with the gaff tape that leaves a really sticky, sickly mess on these. Mm. Uh, it, it, want some goo gone? No, no. This is 
Just like, is it actually like eating the rubber on the cable? No, it's not eating the rubber, but it is just leaving the glue from the gaff tape behind. And gaff is not supposed to leave. That residue. might be just really crappy gaff tape. Well, that's what I thought too. But there was a piece here that was attached only to the metal section of the uh, the end, and that was fine. Interesting. So, <laughs> food for thought. Gross. I mean, of course, the other big use that we have for uh, XLR cables is uh, everything above Cam and Ian's head right now. Uh, all the, uh, I mean, we have the mics on the ceiling, uh, but then oh, also, what a feeling. Uh, if you didn't know, the, the only difference between a XLR cable and a DMX cable, or a three-pin DMX cable, Ride or uh, die. is pretty much um, their usage. Hmm. Paul, there. Do you want a shot? I have it. I, I, I'm, I've cut to you right now. Thank you. Uh, theoretically, they're basically the same cable. Uh, their DMX cables tend to be not as well shielded because you don't have to send uh, audio signals through them. But they are. Uh, I'll switch back to the mic. Okay, thank you. But they are um, very similar. So you can usually, like, for we have actually in the past used XLR cables uh, to connect our lights together. Usually you don't want to go the other way because uh, it's... The, the shielding is a problem? Yeah, DMX cables aren't that uh, aren't, aren't the best. Yeah, they, they are not required to be as heavily shielded. Yes. Um, and, I mean, I'll, I'll, and you don't want to leave the XLR cables instead of DMX cables too much because they're more expensive. Well, the last one was an Amazon Basics. This one is a Nutrik. Hmm. Which has a very nice... Uh, ooh, how do you get that out of there? I feel like I had an amusing anecdote that I wanted to tell, but now I can't remember it. Couldn't have been that good. Oh, right. I was sick for a while, and I got into a space where I was like, I need to watch something familiar and comforting to me. So I went back and watched seasons two, three, and four of Babylon 5. Oh. And? <laughs> Does it not? Oh, that makes sense. No, I mean, like, it, it, it's still, um, it's still good. But it sucks in a very specific way. Oh. <laughs> you know? Like, when you go back and watch and you're like, oh, <laughs> this is... This is some, some storytelling right here. I've been considering um, a rewatch for a while. I, it, it's still fun, right? But it does this thing where the most important thing they decided when making it was that uh, everything had to be plotted out in advance. Mm -hmm. So it's very, like, very slavishly plotted. Or very, like, bloody-minded mm -hmm. in its pacing. And it's also got this weird, like, uh, moral arc to it. Where Sheridan keeps saying, you know, you never start a fight, but you always finish it. And I'm like, is that really what you want your hero to be, like, putting forward? But, like, it's got a lot of fun characters. Like, everything with Londo is awesome. Oh, yeah. Londo's great. Jakar is awesome. Veer is a lot of fun. I, um, there are very few throwaway characters in that series, the more I think about them. Yeah. Uh, and, like, the wordplay is a lot of fun, if a little, like, eye rolly sometimes. Like a little, just a little self-serving on the writer's part. You know, like, I want to be clever today. Um, and you're just like, just get on with the plot. Stop doing the thing. But like, credit where credit is due. Uh, the episode where Sheridan is being tortured by the Earth government. One of my favorite pieces of television, by the way. Yeah, I really enjoyed that episode, actually. Because it, it did one of my favorite things that shows do, which is essentially put on a play. Yeah. Um... I honestly feel that that episode, I like to compare it to uh, There Are Four Lights. Mm -hmm. and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chain of Command is the one that sprung immediately to mind when mm -hmm. I watched it again. And the other one was uh, an episode of Babylon, or Battlestar Galactica called No Exit, mm. um, which was the same idea with two characters kind of like talking to each other a lot of the time. Wasn't that yeah. also like, the name of a play? Yeah, it's a Sartre play. It's where we get the, the, the phrase, hell is other people. Thank you. This cable appears to be fine, so I'm a little worried. There's a good uh, Firefly, the one of the Firefly, ep the episode that where Mal and uh, uh, Wash get. Captured, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Torture. That that one's also quite good. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like making a best of torture in sci-fi is probably not like the best use of time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's it's a pretty gruesome subject, but it does give the actors a lot to work with. Well, it's just... right because you can the person being tortured has to be like oh, 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 right, and they get to do a lot of like fun like reaction, and the person doing the torturing gets to be you know very hands folded and calculating. Yeah. I, I found it very interesting looking at the, uh, and, the the era that was occurring when these series mm -hmm. ran. Well, yeah, like B5 happened squarely in the middle of like the Clinton years. Yeah, very pre-9-11. Yeah. And so they, the, 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 the audience's assumed relationship to torture changes dramatically. Yeah, as, as this thing that is inherently evil, right? Yeah. And... Uh, that well, was not something you could really count on well, after that. Well, not just evil, but something that the good guys didn't do. Yeah. And that was, I think, what was most interesting about the Babylon 5 one was that it was, it was humans doing things to humans. Mm -hmm. And that's where... Well, well, the Babylon 5 one was the Cylons. Yes. Battlestar yes. Galactica. Battlestar, oh, sorry. No, yeah. Yeah, it was humans doing... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. That's, that is... And the Cylons showed up in Babylon 5. That's yeah, that was, really that, was, that, the was the, that was... That threw me in season five. Really jumped the shark, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah, the, the the thing where, like, well, I guess we only get four seasons of this. Better wrap everything up in four seasons. Hey, season four went over really well. Make us another season. What? <laughs> <laughs> you just took away my fifth season. And now it's time for Captain Sheridan's adventures to make more money. Hmm. But yeah, and and you know there there is the like yeah showing, showing uh, a character how a character reacts to that kind of extreme situation mm. can obviously uh, uh, allows a writer to show lots of interesting things about the characters and stuff, which mm -hmm. I always liked. Uh, but it made me appreciate one thing that uh, Battlestar Galactica did, that uh, which was a lot of abstracting the combat. Mm -hmm. Right, they showed a lot of ships firing, or, like flying around, shooting yeah. at each other and exploding. But they were never like Babylon Five does a lot of things in its battle scenes where they're like giving very specific directions to specific ships about like how to maneuver and fly around and do stuff. And yeah. it's like I don't think this really contributes to my understanding of things and or my enjoyment of it. It seems a bit like indulgent. I, I and would... like that's like a very esoteric kind of criticism well it's yeah, again interesting you bring that up because i i would chalk that up to gms's directorial style mm -hmm. but i find it surprising as well considering how uh how much of a military fanboy ronald d moore is well yeah because he was in the navy or yeah. the coast guard or something the navy because he did yeah. he did carrier landings right 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 and, and there's a few scenes apparently that are actually based off of his uh experiences tracking a uh a carrier that had lost its landing lights oh really by the bioluminescent glow of its uh of its wasn't wake. that i remember that being a wasn't that in apollo 13 one of yeah, the stories that yeah. one of the astronauts tells huh. yeah it is like the the yeah his, his power goes out in his cockpit wow i hope i'm not remembering something completely different then <laughs> but yeah like ron lee moore definitely does a lot of that but like I think he got a lot of experience doing that or not on how not to do that when doing Deep Space Nine, yeah. right? Because I remember there's a lot of episodes of that where they try to do that. Or a lot of episodes of DS9 where they're trying to do like pretty detailed... Military. Yeah, like stuff. And like saying the army words doesn't work for me as it turns out. And a lot of the last season of the... Uh, last two seasons of Next Gen too. Right. You can very you can very quickly see where Ronald D. Moore comes into the uh, the production line, hmm. but I feel like when people have kind of you know sat down for a uh, go, sort of space exploration meeting cool aliens thing, and you start getting into like nitty gritty uh, military formations. Uh, it's sort of like it's it's a difficult uh it's a difficult uh bridge whereas like you i guess some you know in something in, in like say you know uh battlestar galactica or something mm -hmm. 
where the sort of ma the the sort of intricacies of the how the ship well. operates under a military thing is sort of integral to how the whole thing is. Right, but like uh, with S Star Trek, it's sort of more uh, a lot more sort of hand waved or out. Well, I mean, like it it should be, but like BSG was the first episode that I our first show I remember watching of like you know a, a pretty well, you know, military sci-fi series where they decided, you know what, we don't actually don't need to do this, mm. right? Uh, notably, there was, was it Resurrection Ship Part 2? The episode Resurrection Ship Part 2, where he actually talks about in the commentary that, um, you know, they had it scripted out where it would be like, you know, they, the ships would jump in to do this attack on a Cylon target, mm -hmm. and they were going to do the thing where it's like, you know, targets on Dratus, you know, closing at this thing prepare to fire main guns and they're like this is dumb <laughs> right and what they did instead was they went from these two characters talking to each other and then did like a two second j cut mm -hmm. where one of the characters says something and then there's a bit of a silence in the conversation you hear the guns start and then it just cuts to the battle scene mm -hmm. right which i thought was cool it's, it's it's more interesting watching these characters mm -hmm. and how they react to the situation yeah. Than, than giving you a blow by blow uh, breakdown of the battle. Yeah. I mean, it was it was fun. I mean, they kind of it, it sort of became obvious at a certain point, but like say like first season of Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. where they didn't have the budget to do oh yeah to these, show the battles to, to show the yeah. battles, and they had I think they used they had, did about three different times in different ways to sort of get around that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in but but it I I felt like it was one of those like you know the, uh you're you know taking taking advantage of your uh problems mm -hmm. to try and, and make it better. Yeah, well I I remember going back and rewatching the first season of Game of Thrones a few months ago, and yeah, uh, two two or three times the like one time um oh I'm sorry Beach Tyrion um gets knocked unconscious before a battle right by yeah by people like running past him. And somebody just smokes him in the head with a but, hammer, kind of casually, and he regains consciousness after the battle. But that's like a really important sort of character thing. Yeah, well, exactly. They use it to establish character. And another one, they focus on Catelyn, who's waiting for her son to return from battle because she's not allowed to, right. mm -hmm. like, witness it. And that ups like the tension and the stakes quite a lot for for the viewers because you don't know what's going on, yeah. right? And you kind of have to share in her like kind of helplessness. And this isn't to say that that uh, it's not possible to do good military television mm -hmm. or, or, or cinematic battles, but they just chose not to in these series. Mm -hmm. Like I, I well, just found that it was one thing that didn't really work for me in B five because it struck me as being very kind of like wanky. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I, I didn't fundamentally, I didn't really care what formation the Drazi escorts were in. Yeah. Right. Like I don't care which evasive action plan the Starship Enterprise is executing. Yeah, that, that to me was the one that always uh, made me question, mm -hmm. took me out of the moment. Was like, yeah, evasive pattern Delta. Well, great, now, so you know what Delta is. Mm -hmm. Odds are they know what Delta so, is so too. We have, so we have four evasive patterns? Is yeah, that... <laughs> and then you just watch the ship go, and then a laser beam goes past. That's the evasive pattern Delta is turn left. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> But don't use your blinker. Oh yeah, that's a, that's an instant fail. <laughs> I still I, I still want to get you Cam into Legend of Gal the Galactic Heroes mm. as a series. Yeah, I I mean the, they made the new one. Yeah, right? for a remake, yeah, is yeah. it any good? Oh no, no. Oh, that's it is too bad. Not the series at all. Oh. It's 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 a modern series. Okay. But that for for all that has going for it. Okay. I still need to finish rewatching Eighth Mobile Suit, mm -hmm. uh, Eighth MS Team, because I started that right before Desert Bus, and then I'm like, because I needed to stay up all night, and I was yeah. figured, you know, it's what about sixteen episodes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can that's, that's I can just time. marathon that, and I was like, <sighs> <laughs> but yeah, the. Uh... The reason for bringing up uh, Legend of Galactic Heroes in this context is that they do do those, uh, the battles, mm -hmm. but they have chosen that, yes, no, this is going to be about properly telling you 
tactics and formations. Okay, and like, it, yeah, if, it, if it's all consistently worked out. Yeah. Right, and well, I'm assuming Legend of Galactic Heroes, well, I know Yamato, battleship, Space Battleship Tomato or whatever mm -hmm. it's called, was <laughs> a largely about relitigating the Pacific Campaign. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, so a lot of its space combat borrowed heavily from World War II stuff, which is, you know, fine. It's what Star Wars did, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's recognizable. It's yeah, kind of in the pop. It's easy to understand. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why Battlestar Galactica was so approachable as well, as they tried mm -hmm. to go, okay, what, what are our fighters like? Oh, it's just like... It's like Top Gun. Yeah. Sure. I can figure that out. Mm-hmm. Damn that installation. But I do like the fact that the first episode basically pulls you through and, and gives you an explanation as to why these two characters are considered military geniuses within hmm. their own world. Okay. And then walks you through their battle plan. Hmm. I, I've been looking at these guys, this guy's pants. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the chances are that these pants either came already with the ripped holes in them. Or did he have to sit there with, or, like, scissors? Yeah. I feel like the chances of these the, those holes getting into the pants, like... Yeah, did he come by them honestly? Naturally through wear is very small. Yeah, I feel like... Yeah, no, I mean... His, his parents bought him the pants, and then they're like, like, you just ruined those good pants that we yeah, bought Yeah, the good for vinyl you. pants we bought for you, mm -hmm. right? It's like you're supposed to wipe them with Windex. Those were for your... First day of school. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, folks. This one looks like garbage, but it'll get there. It, it, it'll get there. I know what I'm doing here. Um, go, or at least I hope I do. Um, yeah, Dark Elf Hot Topic. He went to the... Um, uh, Nagaroth? Is that the, the, the Druchi capital? <laughs> or maybe it's he's like from Clark Harond. Why do I know all this? Why do I know the geography of, of the land of Ch-il? Ch Cam, someone has to here. Oh, I already have my obscure knowledge bases. Mm. I, the, the space combat I enjoyed most um, being described was from the uh, United States Colonial Marine Technical Handbook. Ooh. The, the, the aliens, like, Universe? nerd book. Yep. Yeah where they described um, space combat as being very much like submarine combat. You know, how you had to like maneuver for higher orbits or lo lower orbits and it would affect like how visible you were on sensors, but how fast you could travel. Yeah, that's... And you know, you would have to lay missiles into, like you would have to do, like double bluff people and lay missiles into other people's orbits or drop mines. And then, you know, you'd use coil guns or your rail guns at certain ranges and your particle beams at other ranges. Like at super long range, a particle beam would just kind of like blind sensors. Mm -hmm. But at close range, if you were able to ambush somebody with it, a particle beam would punch through armor. And I'm like, this is sweet. This is awesome. And then I read the essay, Stealth Doesn't Work in Space, and all my joy just <laughs> went away. Just gone. Just took all my joy and flushed it down the toilet. I, and now I can't like things anymore. I always liked uh, the way um, uh, read that essay. Ian M. Yeah. Banks um, talks about fights between um between minds in the culture universe oh yeah yeah where there'll be like a bunch of there'll be like a bunch of uh spaceships flying you know a spaceship flying around with its crew mm -hmm. it enter it comes out of warp and mm -hmm. before the battle is decided like in, less, in hyperspace more like or less. the battle is decided in the first several milliseconds like before the crew even knows that they've come out of warp yeah the both like the the mind and the attacker the like the attacker and the defender are both fired off their entire uh array of various deadly missiles and lasers mm -hmm. and various other things yeah and so the the human crew never knows whether it worked or not in, unless they're dead yeah they're like <laughs> oh we're alive cool well that's um, successful but yeah like I, I remember reading in one of the culture books about how um uh a, a contact units effector fields right basically its ability to manipulate matter at range mm -hmm. is effective across several light years that's and when they were able to perfect that that's when they realized human crews were no longer useful yeah. they're like yeah. yeah warships can have human crews if the mind wants pets 
right? If it doesn't want to get lonely, if it wants someone to talk to that isn't particularly bright, <laughs> right? If it wants people around because people like scritches, right? Then it can then have it a can crew. Happen. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let them sit in a chair and wear a uniform. Yeah. It'll make them feel useful. Macross Plus, mm -hmm. 1997. Like the, I think one of the points in the, in the essay was that the Voyager, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, have power signatures roughly on par with the light bulb in your fridge, mm -hmm. and we can detect them <laughs> out there, <laughs> right? I mean, we do need to know where they are to detect them, though. Yeah, but if you're capable of launching interplanetary warships, yeah. then... Yeah, I guess the point is there's there's a whole lot of nothing out there, and anything mm -hmm. that is there is basically just a beacon. Yeah. yeah. So, like, and they're not even doing anything, really, <laughs> right? You know, presumably a warship would be yeah. maneuvering or keeping crew alive by being above absolute zero. <laughs> that said, just because we can't attend. Uh, notice these things doesn't mean we know what to do about it. Oh yeah, but it, it was it was an interesting essay. I don't actually know how uh, true it is, but I I was like, oh, this is an entertaining reading that's ruining my life. That's you know I, I like those. Yeah. That was one of my favorite gags that we've done. I think it was in like the what is it, Celestial Sea thing that we did. It was like making fun of the the redubbing a video game thing, but just a thing the thing where it's. Somebody goes, divert all power to shields! And then just all the lights and all the <laughs> engines and everything yeah. turn off. And it's like, okay, Wait. let me rephrase that. <laughs> divert unnecessary Most, yeah. power to shields. I uh, think okay, we lost the vending machine on third deck. I think that's why the phrase <laughs> changed in Star Trek after a few seasons. Divert all non-essential power to the shields. I mean, I, I like to think that Federation ships are pretty unique in that trait. Whereas if, like... You know, you go on an ex a Starfleet officer goes on an exchange with the Klingon Self Defense Force, or whatever the Romulan Navy is called, and they're like, "Divert power to shields," and the crew are like, the, "Well, the shields are on. Yes. They have they, all the power they, they need." Are you telling me your shields aren't running at full power all the time? Yeah. We'll write that down. Sure. What do you, you mean they're scalable? Or, or it's just like, your shields are at full power all the time, but. How, how do you power your, uh, you know, holodecks and hydroponics and, and your uh, children's school that you have on your... Uh, we don't... We have, have a 42-gallon 42, 42 barrel of gach. If you're lucky, it'll be finished by the time our tour is. Yeah, exactly. You have schools on your warship? What's wrong with you? Oh my god, we have to change our rules of engagement. I mean that that was actually a, a neat idea. Well, yeah, the yeah. Is that before the Defiant, the mm -hmm. Federation had literally never built a warship. Yeah. Well, that or um, they were like, and they, also enter in the fact that they've been like that they've been mostly wiping the floor with other people with their like, just general kind of yeah. Well, like everything ships. ships. Yeah. There, there's that essay about how um, Starfleet can beat the Borg because. Every Starfleet ship is just capable of pulling uh, an arbitrary amount of like uh, pseudo magic horse nonsense. Like Starfleet engineers, right? And the Borg are like, man, why? <laughs> right? One, one ship defeated a cube. Um, but I, I kind of like the idea that the Galaxy class. The, the, the justification I heard for why there was, like, you know, families on the Galaxy class was they were deep space explorers. Yeah. And they were supposed to carry a small chunk of the Federation into unknown space. Kind of like um, systems vehicles in the culture universe. Right? It wasn't so much a ship as a city that could fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... The impression I got as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a, a small town flying through space, but without small town people in it. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, man. like like it was a mobile embassy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I thought that was kind of neat. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense when you consider the captain it was given. Mm -hmm. A guy who's basically holding out for an ambassador position. <laughs> Have they said what uh, Patrick Stewart will be doing in the new 
Star Trek brought, series because yeah. they hired him. Yeah. yeah, they brought back Patrick Stewart for, an, last I heard, a um, undisclosed Star Trek series. Undisclosed I, TV series. And... I hope it's like Star Trek Klingon and Star Trek Borg, where they bring on the old people to do educational videos for the people, for like the newer groups of whatever, and it's some young, fresh cadet who is watching like old guest lectures from, from Jean-Luc Picard speaking at the Academy or some shit <laughs> like that. He's long dead. Because it can't be like uh, Discovery. No. Well, that's the, the question is whether or not they're uh, going to be doing it as a uh, in, in which universe it will happen. Because I believe that Discovery takes place in the Prime Universe. Right? Yeah. So my, my my discovery discovery takes place in not the uh, not the Kelvin verse. Yes, the the, the non the non movie universe. Right. Yeah. But I was really hoping that that would that they'd actually do something interesting and do an alternate timeline mm. next gen era where Picard wasn't nothing happened in next gen the way it happened. Mm. This is an alternate universe Picard where maybe he show he completes his life as a science officer oh, and yeah, is offered yeah. a command later in life on the mm. science vessel. Interesting. So he's like a, a branch off of tapestry. Essentially, essentially yeah. Um, the one thing I would do, and I know I've said this before, if I was given the helm of a Star Trek series, is go full in mirror universe. Mm, yeah. set, set the series in the mirror universe with a deep space... I guess in, they wouldn't have explorers. The human empire wouldn't have explorers. Or the Terran empire wouldn't have explorers. Ships. And conquerors. Yeah, yeah they would have vehicle. Yeah, a deep reconnaissance or a, um, a scout vehicle. Yeah. Kind of in the mode of, of Enterprise. I was going to Like say, a large, powerful ship. Like they a feel. Voyager, then. Yeah. yeah. And uh, have that crew slowly turn from being Terrans into being humans. Through the because, power of exploration? Yeah, through the power of exploration and their encounters with the universe at large away from the influence of the Terran hegemony. Also, the Emperor would be Khan. Of course. Who would be kept alive by uh, traveling around in a ship just at subluminal, like, 0.99 C. But, but outside of a warp field, they're yeah. negating the... Uh, yeah, just take yeah. advantage of relativity. So he's yeah. like, he's immortal, right? <sighs> That's something I don't... I would love to see more of in science fiction. Contemporary mm -hmm. science fiction is playing with relativity and the time dilations thereof. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we know what happens in the mirror universe, and what happens in the mirror universe is that isn't the Terran hegemony overthrown very shortly after Mirror Mirror? Because um, during, Mirror Universe Spock... Yeah. During DS9 at some point. Well, I, I thought what happened was that Mirror Universe Spock, his, encou his encounter with Kirk, uh, puts the seed in Spock's mind that this is not the way that things have to be. Mm. And Spock overthrew the Emperor in the Mirror Universe? I want to say that was what happened. Because Yesterday's Enterprise is still based on the Mirror Mirror Universe. Though. No, Yesterday's Enterprise isn't. There were no Mirror Universe episodes in TNG. Yeah. They went back to it several times in DS9 and a couple of times during Enterprise. I thought, I thought there was the one where... Oh, right, I'm sorry. The one where the Enterprise C comes through the rift. Yes, okay, but that goes into a... it back. That goes to a different universe. Yeah. Where... The Federation is largely the same, only it's getting its chronometer cleaned by uh, the Klingons. Right. Thanks, Captain Fraser. I just want to. I, I like the idea of the 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 mirror universe. Like they, you know, encounter, uh, go to a planet with, you know, that's surprisingly like Earth in dealing with issues of that that uh, you know are. Uh, important to our current day situation uh and be like sir we can't uh, you know we can't we, we can't interfere we have to remember the prime directive well that's right the prime directive kill everybody we meet yeah all right well let's all right that. well yeah it's, <laughs> all right <laughs> five billion eight billion nine billion all it's, right take their stuff it's yeah it's, it's it's weird just that one small change in this universe of that the prime directive <laughs> Mm -hmm. always interfere and then kill them. Yeah. Prime directive. Take their stuff. Acquire currency. It's fun, but it's pure cut. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's... I feel like the mirror universe is only fun because in the contrast to the real universe. Yeah. Where, where humans aren't like that. Like, 
it wasn't yeah the small spoiler stuff the mirror universe stuff in discovery is kind of weird yeah i didn't actually like it very much mm. in discovery I was, I was like, eh, swing and a miss. I was surprised they, they held on to it so long. Yeah. Oh, spoilers for Discovery Season 1, by the way, from mm -hmm. this point on. There is the Mirror Universe in Discovery Season 1. Mm -hmm. It's a year old at this point. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, Mike Lunsford just uh, finished his, finished their first uh, watch through. Of... Oh, yeah. yeah. What, did, what did they think of it? They were not keen on, uh, on Season 1. Mm -hmm. Like, were... I, I enjoyed it as I was watching it, and, you know, I because I felt it was fine. Mm -hmm. I found myself quite often whenever I wanted to talk about it in conflict with people who were like, this is the worst thing that has ever happened. And I'm like, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> Have you seen Enterprise? Yeah, I, I enjoyed it extensively. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm actually, I'm, I, I'm excited to see episode two of season two because mm -hmm. I was not taken by the, uh, the cor course correction that people have been mentioning. Yeah. It's a pretty, I, I have to say, like, it is, you know, one way or another, uh, you have, it is a pretty uh, uh, ballsy kind of, oh, yeah, let's, uh, let's just do a totally different story. But I, I personally, and I, I know a mm -hmm. lot of people didn't feel this way specifically, but mm -hmm. I personally felt that uh, season one of Discovery felt a lot more like Star Trek than anything with the name Star Trek has in a very long time. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was, it was totally adequate. Um, I mean, I, I would love lots and lots of episodes like Chain of Command, mm -hmm. right? I would love, uh, but I don't know if you can start off like that. You kind of need to have a, uh, in both instances in the Babylon 5 and in the uh, Star Trek. When you, you need to establish what that character is like. Mm -hmm. You need to have, you have put them in dozens of difficult situations that they are clearly equipped to handle mm -hmm. before you can put them in a no-win situation yeah. where they don't win. Oh, that was hard. It's... Those were both hard episodes to watch. I, my, I guess the 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 real trick with the with the new the Star Trek thing is that they're they're run into the problem of the like, eh, something that we've run into sometimes when we're doing TV ser or uh, web series, but you're like if you make a course correction like that, it's like anybody who didn't like the show has already left, Le yeah, and is not going to come back, and anybody who was liking it the way it was is now annoyed that you did it. That you're changed mm -hmm. so getting people to come back is a real tough one yeah. it's a toughie Ooh, that's a hot plug i also have been enjoying the orville <laughs> which is the like almost you know the old sort of the tribute to old school tell me about that because I've, I, I made the choice not to watch The Orville, mo partially because there was too much out there. But. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's deliberately silly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, much more of a comedy than, cause, you know, it's Seth MacFarlane. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you're, but it's a lot more uh, grounded and sort of uh, real or sort of, I guess, had, heart i guess or or you know real sort of emotional not like excessively emotional but actually like dealing with real stuff okay then you know something it's not like strictly comedy but uh it's got some fun stuff in it okay fair enough i wouldn't like wholeheartedly recommend it but i i enjoy it the read i got from it was that it was it, it did seem to be coming from a person who had love for the source material oh certainly yeah yeah um and uh and there's there's like, I kind of enjoy the the well, almost sort of realistic aspect of it, basically like more like what real people would do when in a Star Trek kind of situation. Right. Like the the people on the bridge would probably you know take bets on passing uh, uh whatever asteroids or something <laughs> like just you know more the 
they they have a lot of fun with just kind of people the, dicking, the universe people dicking around or mm. yeah in the universe you know there's weird uh there's like a guy who can one of the people on the ship uh has this like crazy alien physiology that uh that and so they keep having like bets for him to eat things <laughs> <laughs> they're like oh no you can't eat that oh that's amazing <laughs> It's like, okay, okay, okay. Now eat the, you know, eat this light bulb. Hmm. Um, what was I going to say? There was a thing. I had a thing. It was a clever insight, and now it's gone. Oh, right. I watched Solo on Netflix the other day. Oh. I mean, everyone has said, like, it's a very unnecessary film. And I'm like, all Star Wars films are unnecessary <laughs> films. In fact, I don't think I want to see a necessary Star Wars film. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever. It'll be fun and, like... Well, Star Wars. Yeah. How, how bad, how bad could it, can it be? And I watched it and I'm like, I think I'm bored. <laughs> yeah. I'm watching a Star Wars movie and I'm bored. Which is and I was I just like, thought possible. yeah. I, and I was disappointed in myself. I mean, Donald Glover. Oh, Danny, yeah. Yeah, Danny Glover. Donald, no, Donald, Donald Glover <laughs> has a lot of fun with Mr. his role. Glover. Mr. Glover has a lot of fun with his role. And whoever is doing the, like, Every setting design and the costumes and, like, designing the aliens and... Oh, yeah, there was care. There was a lot of care, right? It's the kind of care that happens when uh, every special effects artist who has gone into doing special effects in films and doing costuming in films has been drawing Star Wars aliens yep. their entire <laughs> life, right? This was a lot of people's, like, dream project, obviously. Yeah. It's like, I, yeah, there's that aspect of, like, I bet... Everybody working on this project really enjoyed working on this yeah. project. Yeah. Like, after the words, which is which is fun, but like not necessarily the best way to produce material. Yeah. Like, yeah. After the words "Clone Wars," the only other phrase that brings that brought so much anticipation to Star Wars fans was Kessel Run. Yeah. And I and there 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 it is. There it is. It's happening. They yep. go through the Kes They do it in a short time. It's not what I wanted. Yeah, I was like, ah, oh, I guess I didn't need to see this. I mean, this is more or less exactly how I imagined it. Mm -hmm. They're doing the thing. Oh, they're playing the asteroid theme music from Empire Strikes Back as they slide the, Through the as gate. the Falcon does the exact same thing. Like, now I know what they meant when they said unnecessary because there's no, nothing, nothing, nothing unusual. I don't know what I was expecting. And honestly. we learned this lesson from the prequels. Yeah, that. Uh, I mean, I, I guess. I guess this is me remembering that Star Wars movies are for are primarily for kids. Yeah. Right, and there's nothing wrong with that. There, there, there's a way you could have moved, still made that movie for kids, though. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't want to be one of those people who's just only give me original stories. Mm -hmm. But I think what I would have preferred there is to find out, I, I would have loved to find out how uh, Han Solo got his start, how he met uh, Donald Glover as Yeah, as Lando. As Lando. Yeah. You don't need to hand, you don't need to put everything in that. Maybe the Kessel Run is something he did a few years later after that story. Yeah, it doesn't have to be absolutely everything, right? Everything important in Han Solo's life happened, happened within life. like two days of each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer for him, really. Yeah, yeah it was apparently all downhill from that. And he had been on Tatooine for years at that point. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. being like, all right, this is going to come in one day. This is going to pay off. He's gotta... just been reliving his Kessel Run, uh, like, glory. Just, yeah. Just got to get a new droid. Just gotta get a new droid, and then Lando will be okay. Just gotta like, get a new droid. It's just, yeah, I don't know. It was. Was that? The it was a hand job I neither wanted <gasps> nor particularly enjoyed. <laughs> and I'm like, I guess this is happening. This is yeah. a really weird Yelp review. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> I don't really want to. I don't really want to stop this from continuing. No, I, yeah. and, and I know exactly where this is going. <laughs> And I'm not... I guess. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Was Solo the one that Lord and Miller were supposed to be on? And I don't know. And got removed from it? I can't remember. I think so. Someone in the chat will probably correct us if not. Yeah. Mm. I have so much faith in those guys. Uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Mm -hmm. Because of... because Not because of the Lego movie, which was fantastic mm -hmm. it was so much fun and not because of 
into the Spider-Verse, which was fantastic and so much fun. I have so much faith in those guys because of Clone High. Mm. Wait, really? Yep. <laughs> it's the same people? Same guys. And I'm like, if they were churning out something that good back then, and they were able to make the jump to feature films and then do the Lego movie, like with lots of time in between. So they were doing working on other things, and I'm like, what am I missing that I don't know about? Did you catch the Clone High reference in Spider-Verse? Oh, God. In Times Square, there is a poster for a Clone High movie, essentially. Ah, uh, right. No, I saw it pointed out later. I did not I did not see... I couldn't see anything go by in the Spider-Verse in Spider <laughs> because everything's happening in that movie all at the same time. Everything's happening. It's so much fun, and it's so overwhelming. You're too old for movies. It's true. I am. I think I am too old for for that movie. And I mean, or rather, it bears rewatching. Mm. That's a that's a much nicer way of saying it. I just don't know if if I re, like. I'm kind of like I'd like to I'd like to watch it again, but I already know how it works out. And I think part of the fun of the kineticism of it was that you don't know how it's going to work out, and that you do feel like you're on a roller coaster the whole time. And knowing how it, every plot point bears out. And being so fresh in my mind, I'm like, I don't think I could actually watch it and enjoy it the same way. I'd just be too busy looking for all the fun bits, all the special effects and all the other stuff. I mean, that's what, a second, that's what a second viewing is often for. Yeah. I would argue. <sighs> there we go. I might actually get two cables done today. Nice. I mean, it is it is two minutes to seven. Uh oh. Oh well, we've been. Hmm. Technically, this. I, I mean, like, I get we started at five. Technically, the stream would probably go to around seven, but I mean. Well, I mean, we you can know, do you do whatever. Yeah. Shall we have work to finish? Shall we shut it down at, at the two hour mark rather than at the top of the hour? Well, do you want to be do you want to be interrupted in the middle of doing a task, or do you want to finish the tasks you are doing? I want to finish the task, honestly. Mm. I, I just I'm guessing your task may be a bit longer than mine. Oh, is. well, my task will go until it's done. Okay. And can be interrupted at any time. Um. So we were we were now we were talking before the uh, uh, before we went online that uh, sadly the the game. Crystal Tower, or, or Silver Tower, Silver Tower, that those miniatures are for, has kind of uh, been supplanted now. Yeah, at least from what I understand, they've Although, just I mean, decided to make Warhammer Quest. Obviously, we can still play it. Yeah. Like oh yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I'd certainly like to try it. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I don't even know if it's any good at this point, but we have such pretty guys for it. Yeah. Um, but that that being said, of course, it's not like these can't be used for something else. Hero Quest. Mm hmm. We can come full circle. We now paint figures for Warhammer to use in Hero Quest because it's easier to play Hero Quest than it is to. Mm. Like, does Silver Tower uh, mesh with Hero Quest at all? I mean, in terms of mechanics, I would not. I would assume not. But, mm -hmm. but do, yeah, those are those are pretty dope little minis. Well, thank you. I want to see the dwarf, the the dwarf berserker, mm -hmm. that is wearing no pants, mm -hmm. and I feel like I want to I want to watch uh, that dwarf berserker and the guy you're painting right now, like go off shopping together, <laughs> 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 and just see see if they could agree on any place to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and then I want to know what store, like, what kind of store they would both in find something interesting at. Well, Hot? we'd have to have like you know a fairly loose dress code. Hot right? topic. What are you interested in? Leggings, breechy breeches, trousers. <laughs> like, uh, loin well, cloth? I need this guy needs hair product, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this guy needs Windex for his pants. Because <laughs> you can't they... launder vinyl pants for shit's sake, people. You I just need, wipe them down. I need a Totoro backpack. <laughs> they could, I, I feel like they could maybe bond over hair hair products. Yeah, possibly. Like, I mean, this the, the, the Dwarven Fire Slayer needs Stronghold. And I assume 
uh, the the uh, the um, the dark elf needs volume, mm -hmm. right? You know, nothing too heavy. I feel like the dark elf also uh, needs some sort of like leather conditioner to treat the strips of flayed skin, which is probably the same thing that the dwarf is using on his own skin. Yeah, well, look how like soft and supple it is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Something with like ten percent urea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. That for paper production. The dwarf smells kind of like beef jerky. I, I, I guess he just sends himself. Probably, yeah. He has a pet egg. <laughs> <laughs> or a microplane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like that scene in Ricky O where uh, th there's the fight in the wood shop in the prison and they throw the planer at the one guy. Jesus. <laughs> And the special effect for it is they throw a slice of bologna through and across the <laughs> shot. <laughs> God damn. Wow. Good. <laughs> oh, I love that movie so much. It's not, it's not, I've never seen it. It's not gory in a buckets of blood kind of way, though. Oh, it, it, well, I mean, there's buckets of blood, but it's not credible in the least okay right it starts off absurd and uh kind of ramps up from okay. there cool <laughs> um like at one point ricky oh ricky is fighting a guy who has a knife who cuts his arm mm -hmm. and uh ricky's arm goes limp because the tendon has been cut and ricky fishes the tendon out of his arm <laughs> and ties it back together with yeah. his teeth, and then, like, does this. <laughs> then he continues to use his arm in the yeah. next scene with no damage. Yeah, no damage. Yeah. Right? It's, like, it's it's stupid, yeah. but it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, um, it's practically cartoonish. Yeah. I recently watched something where a character had their Achilles tendon severed. Blah. Ugh. And I just, and they were back up in minutes. And that was, uh, yeah, that took me out of it. Is one. it like in Prometheus when Dr. Shaw has her abdominal muscles cut to uh, remove the alien lava and then it's just, you know, she sits up. Yeah, yeah, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks. That was a great scene. Like she's... she's I'm not, not mad. She's not good at crunches anymore, but... Hey, what did this fucking fly off nowhere? Yeah, that, sound, that sounds awesome, killer robot. Let's do that. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have fun. What the fuck ended up Mac and me? <laughs> like, you, you, you expect the robot to just chew some bubble gum that blows a bubble that says, we'll be back. <laughs> and they fly off into the sunset. With all our money. With my <laughs> money. With my ticket money. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Because you know we'll go again. And, like, they stole... The, the, the surgery scene in Prometheus, well, stole it, used, they repurposed a scene from a comic, Alien's Labyrinth, mm -hmm. where the main character in a flashback has to do that to himself to remove a, um, a dead alien larva. Mm, really? Yeah, because he's the last survivor, and he goes back to the, like, the surgery suite on his ship. Because uh, it is such a cool idea. Yeah, and it makes a point of saying, like, I couldn't get out of the chair for three days, right? Cause... like. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to. And finally, I had to, right, to find water. But, like, <sighs> I don't even know how long that recovery would take, even with magic space stuff. And anyone had to cut open their, uh... Like, I, I don't know how long you're out for after a C-section. Yeah, I, I completely have no idea. I think it's that direction. I'm going to double check because I don't want to F up a cable and have to desolder it again. Pin 2. It's true. The answer depends on just how magic your magic space magic is. Let's say it's magic enough for the plot to work, I guess, is the takeaway. The correct answer in any situation is magic enough. So set your switch to more magic. Yeah, it's true. If you even like, if you even think about like an appendectomy, which is a comparatively minor piece of surgery compared to what 
she under, underwent. Her abdominal muscle is very important for many things. You use it all the time. Mm -hmm. I imagine I'm using it right now to remain upright. Yep. Yeah, actually, my uh, 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 my dad had a, a abdominal issue, and and so to the extent that a large portion of the his sort of uh, stomach area is sort of scar tissue now, and they had to cut through this, then he just it doesn't grow back. He just Ow. can't really do like sit ups now. He's a very right. strong guy, but it's just that muscle isn't there anymore. Hmm. Brutal. Like, I remember when I was a teenager, I did martial arts for once. Um, and I was very bad at it, so I had to do a lot of sit-ups. Mm. Um, and I could not sit up <laughs> for a while after, right. that, after that lesson. I was like, yeah, and you know what? I'm, I'm okay. I'm yeah. a, I don't need to do that anymore. You go to the teacher, and you'd be like, so, as a percentage, how much of these martial arts are going to involve sit-ups, do you think? <laughs> Like, for you, many of them. <laughs> In fact, give me 15 right now. You may leave when you grasp the pebble from my hand. I can get you a rock from the parking lot. If, yeah. If you really want a rock. You must use your abs to grab it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Weirdo. Uh, Dude, I need is to... There, is there some sort I of... I think Sensei's a twisted abs, abs freak. Yeah, is there some sort of ab-based martial art? I don't know, but apparently it was the thing where it's like... <sighs> Fine, go give me 15 more sit-ups. Like, okay, this seems like an odd way to punch someone. It's like, oh, son, no. <laughs> no, no. You, you, you won't be punching anyone. I'm thinking of Shaolin soccer, where there's the like form of Shaolin Kung Fu that where he can just like grab things with his stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty Iron Shirt, I think it's called. Nice. Uh, so is that, he's got uh, some sort of uh, leathery. Uh, yeah, let's go with that. I. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of. I guess it's sort of pro proto leather in a way. Yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of flair. You know, he has to speak with the manager, and this is the result. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the he got dried blueberries in his um in his smoothie, at Planet Organic instead of fresh blueberries as advertised. <laughs> Asked to speak with the manager, and here he is. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, okay, I think I've got the pants into a situation where the... At least... I mean, it's so hard. He. Yeah. <laughs> he also has his pants in the situation. Yeah, after, after you get these on, you're like, no, I'm wearing these. Now. This is a commitment. We had to go first. <laughs> right? Like, I'm not taking these off for anyone. If, I, if need be, I can pee through the hole near my crotch. Yeah. You know, it took me two hours to get this outfit on. And a lot of baby powder. Is Tulk carcinogenic? Well, I won't even think about it too much. Uh, I, I feel like carcinogenic is not something that is in the vocabulary of it, most adventurers. Uh, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, what's what's cancer? Oh, it's something that'll kill you in about 30 years. I have a lot of things that will kill me in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> it's like, oh, so it's like a it's like a particularly strong owl bear is what you're saying. It's yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's it 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 it's what killed all the people in such a way that made me want to become an adventurer. <laughs> Being bonked on the head by an orc infinitely preferable mm -hmm. to worrying about cancer from asbestos laced talc. The owl bear was inside you. <laughs> For a little well, briefly. <laughs> like the with the claw swipe. <laughs> oh, no, it's a metaphorical owl. Oh god, I have to actually Cam, I want to show you this. Alright. Um because Christine Love is playing Fantasy Star. Oh yeah. And she's like, I have a problem with Wait, some I'm... of the some of the names in this game. Online or Owl Bear. Wow. <sighs> Good owl bear, eh? That's an eyeball with wings. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a flappy owl. Yeah. Or that's a flap... Barbarian. Nope. Take again. Barbrian. Barbrian. <laughs> yep. I knew that guy. Yep. Barbrian. <laughs> Barbrian. Supposed to. Hotel Brian. Mm-hmm. 
Tube Brian, Bar Brian, Rod Brian. Back in the 1800s, many wealthy families actually had a house Brian. Crowbar Brian. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't share that with the audience, but if you follow Christine Love's Twitter account, it'll so, come up. Somebody posted it in the chat. Good. Mm. All right. And for those of you watching the VOD, Tough Titty. <laughs> you can Google it. Yep. Do not Google Tough Titty. Just, yeah, just Google Fantasy Star Owl Bear. <laughs> Two words. Mm. As is tradition. There we go. The trick is... The result, okay. The result of a mad wizard who didn't know what an owl or a bear was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the thing. You'll notice the touchstone colors for these miniatures are this kind of like smoky white, black, and red, right? Like they each have these same colors with a little bit of like this bone color as well. So, you know, the flash of red hair, the, the smoky mist, Mm -hmm. The black clothing in this case. The red cloak here with the white... I forget what they're called, but the white, like, robe. Yeah. How? I mean, I suppose I could just do blood for the red. Right? I guess. Is he, um... He's got not red hair? No, I wanted the, the hair to be, like, white for this one. Little just, ribbons in his hair. I was going to say, re, re, repaint the leather so it's red. Yeah. Fox but like, blood. I don't know, maybe maybe red on the chains and the hooks. I feel like this is a discussion that they've had, that they had. It's like, uh, I know, I don't want to be like a, you know, that guy. Yeah, but we have but, a look here going, Ted. Yeah, but, Ted, we feel like you're maybe not uh, meshing with the whole, you know, when, when we go into a, a, a town, mm -hmm. we like to, you know, make we have it a look, uh, make it a whole thing. Yeah. Like, come on, Skylar. <laughs> we agreed. You said you're going to dye your hair red. Oh, fine. I'll go get some Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, that's being 13 again. <laughs> red toenails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe. A I don't know. A, yeah. Hell of a look. <laughs> Keeping those, like, not chipped when you're walking through a dungeon, that's I mean, a full-time job right there. Unique. A creature of unique poise. That's why he spends so much time jumping. Mm. It's like, ah, no, 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 don't, no, don't mess with the nails. I swear, like, when I get my nails done, when TQ does my nails, I chip them by using a mouse, that right? Is... Or, like, reading a book and suddenly I just chip my nails. How do you... How? How? <laughs> I guess very gingerly. I'm guessing that's just part of the uh, the process. I mean, also, it's probably like, you know, uh, uh, mo uh, most of a lifetime spent not paying attention to where your nails are in relation to other things. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's definitely a skill, but it's one that impresses me more now. Well, managed to get two cables done today. So I think we're, uh, I'm considering that's, that a success. Yeah, that's two cables up. That's saying yeah. one of them is the right angle one, eh? Yeah. But I just noticed there was another right angle one, which I probably should have hit first, but we'll get that one next time. Excellent. So I guess... Yeah, you earned your keep today, Ian. Yeah, we're only down to <laughs> three Did we, bad um, ones. Did we I mean, test I guess them we for... Could, we could, you, you've tested them for sort of continuity, I guess. But, yes. Uh, I guess the we there may be further testing in terms of actual, like, Making sure that the sort of shielding isn't compromised or anything. Well, like there's that. no there's there's no cross talk between the wires. Okay, the, that's the question I had thing. was um, like I know there's at least one of them that the way the sort of loose connection was manifesting was just like lots and lots of noise on mm. the line. But that's okay. worth testing in a different manner. I had I had wondered if there was actually a break further down in the cable, mm. where one of those things where it's like you test continuity and then you have somebody basically move along and like start adding not kinks but you start to put like a 90 degree bend in the cable in different places until you actually hear a difference mm -hmm. and if then nothing comes up then it's like okay well then the cable is fine all the way through because that's something that's
harder to test when a cable's just lying there. Like when you're actually moving it and holding it up, and you know, there's a sway to the cable, and all of a sudden you start to get static. Well, that's a job for not me. Yeah. Well, we can we can <laughs> feel we can feel that out as we perform with it. Exactly. So that uh, mm -hmm. are you good to? I, I'm good to. I'm, I'm good to break here. Then let's wrap this up, and I want to say thank you to everyone who came and joined us here today on this impromptu Tinker Tailor Solder Fry, where we just sat around, shot the science fiction shibboleth, and uh, yeah, it was a good time. Thank mm. you so much for watching, everyone. Specifically, we'd like to thank people who subbed here twitch.tv and of course to those over at patreon.com slash loading ready run for showing their support there. Paul, do we have tonight's subscribers ready? We do. Ooh. All right. Starting with Max Quizzy, who has subscribed for 23 months. Thank you for your continued support. Scratch Monkey has come back for the sixth month. Happy half year. Got to thank Pink Honey CMB for 23 months of resub goodness. I'm looking for a new pod of Loki X or Loki 99, Loki IXIX for the 14th month. It's kind of like a like a dark blue. I mean, yeah, I think so. Yeah, green, that green. Here comes Blast. <laughs> Femur for 24 months of subscription. Mythos Magic has come back for the 24th month. Happy 2 year anniversary. And thanks to Sham the Wow for 15 months of subscriptions. Many thanks to Orion's Rise 1 for the 13th month. Lucky 13. And thank you to Flathead for 6 months of subscription. Many thanks to Nambra for the 25th month. Ooh, a prime number. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and big ups to Kakmi. Kakmise? Kakmise. For four months. Uh, shout outs to Hunter Prime for the 26th month of continuous support. Thank you. Cheers to Applesauce for 11 months. One more month to the big one, too. Actually, is it uh, thanks for Astral Goth for the four months of contiguous support? Ooh, that's correct. Yeah. Ampenstein is a 19 month subscriber, and we are thankful for that. Also, gratitude goes out to Feldheim C for the 65th month. Of support. Big numbers. Scar, Red Tiger, for 32 months of subscription. Thank you. Amber Zen has come back for the sixth month. Happy biannual subscription anniversary. I'm happy to welcome Sir Biffalo Esquire, who has been here for 28 months. Thank you. Also, thanks to the Ghost of Zero for 17 months of support. And here's Snake12341, who has been here for 13 months. Uh, many thanks to Sue Fan. 22 for the 13th month of support. And Barb for Ryan has been here for 22 months. Am I getting that wrong? Suhono has come back for the 28th month. Thank you. Thanks to Magic Music JB, who is a brand new subscriber. Welcome to the channel. And to Syncreen, who is a brand new subscriber. Sign crime. Sign. Sign. Feathertail38 is a three month sub. And we thank you for sticking around. Fish Sticks has come back for the 46th month. Some jams. DSPMU has been here for 26 months, and I hope that's not how you pronounce your name. How I said it. Max Simus has come back for the 28th month. Thank you. Big ups to Maternal. Maternal Amazon Revenue. Maternal, Maternal Amazon, Amazon Revenue. Revenue is a brand new subscriber. Wow. Very good. Zolbag has come back for the 14th month. Thank you. And finally, thanks to Luminaire P, who has subscribed for 26 months. Hey, Lumi, thanks. And for the 1001 bits, many shout outs to Earthen One, Pharaoh Bender 27, E, Block, Banrail, and Discordian Token. Ooh, thank you for those bits, da, bits, da, da bits. Yeah. So, we should probably wrap up by letting you know about what's coming up on today's streams, and that starts tomorrow. We're running back the ruining of the schedule, because I'll be here at 9 a.m. to play No More Heroes Travis Strikes Again. One of my favorite, yeah, one of my favorite runs of uh, video games. And finally, back on the Switch. Neat. Looking forward to this new and weird uh, 
chapter in the No More Heroes saga. Then at noon, it's time for mine o'clock because mm. that's the new mine o'clock time only for tomorrow. After which, James will be continuing his six hour stint in the seat with one more playing uh, Player Nuns Battlegrounds until 6 p.m. when he is kicked out by Cam and Corey. To play. Oh, sorry, Please. yes, we're playing XCOM 2. We yeah. played XCOM UFO Defense last week, so we thought we'd look at the newest incarnation of the game and how, what 20 years, 25 years does to a property. Wow. So how many games are there between the original one and <laughs> XCOM 2? One. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. It's very strange. How odd. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's only one XCOM game that, that laid fallow for many, many decades with nobody doing anything with it. And then on Wednesday, LRMTG on the Magic Channel returns to the Magic Channel. Join Graham and James for some slightly above average MTG. And of course, Let's Nope at 1 p.m. where Ben and Adam will be screaming at computers. <laughs> Finally, AFK will be a as yet named game, we'll find out what that is when it occurs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then we, yeah, we things are currently up in the air with AFK last, this week. Last minute change on that, but uh, that will be definitely, I mean, it'll definitely happen and it'll mm -hmm. be a thing. It will be live and something will happen. Not a loading ready live though. I do want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. And then of course the schedule continues on as it does with Games of Chance on Thursday. What uh, what's uh, our, the category? Have you decided that yet? Yeah, our our category this week uh, is cute, cute games. Ooh. Oh, so we we're looking for games with adorable animals, or you know, uh, unicorns and rainbows, or whatever. Uh, I'm going to give you a copy of Card Captor Sakura for the Dreamcast. <laughs> See, this is we. The yeah, uh, if you look at the cute category in in. And Steam, there are a lot of like dating games in there, which is not what we're looking for. <laughs> we're looking for more, uh, more fluffy, adorable cuteness. No, then you need Napple Tail, also for the Dreamcast. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I believe Slime Rancher has been has been suggested. Then, of course, after that will be our good friends. Hello, MTG. Yeah, Hello, MTG. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Wasn't sure how to. Take that. Good friends, Lure MTG. Graham and James. They're our friends. They'll be playing Magic. It's also our friend. And then I'm coming back with more Tinker Tailor Soldier Fry. Uh, we're going to be working on the oscilloscope again, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to find something to go alongside that. So yeah, this was, this was a bonus, Tinker yes. Tailor. Uh, there will be yet another one. Hmm. Uh, and you've gone, it's, you've gone from bi-weekly to bi-weekly the other way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When's Tinker Taylor? Bi-weekly. What does that mean? Don't know anymore. Bi-weekly. Yeah. It's, the definition is literally both. And then on Friday, we've got Now Kiss at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, crap shoot in the afternoon at 1. Join us for the crapping of the shoots. And then the paper fight returns at 6 p.m. And it's the Ravnica Allegiance that was oh, the, right. the yeah. pre-release was uh, last weekend, and so we're going to be uh, drafting doing it. doing our six-man draft for that. I, 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 I hope to put together a little little deck I like to call Rakdos Agro. It's I, uh, underdrafted, I feel. Rad set. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, uh, oh no, yeah, game yeah. Adam's game house. And then, and then finally, we got the Lugger Raid Live, uh, our first of 2019. It's back, baby. Mm. Coming in on uh, January 26th. So all sorts of great stuff coming up. Keep an eye on that calendar and the events page and all that good stuff to uh, find out more. Sorry, the uh, schedule was a little wonky. Uh, but uh, such is the way, the fate of of the uh, when we're, the plane travel can be a little bit tricky. All mm. is back to correctness. But... I want to say thank you once again so much to everyone for coming here and joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow at Do 9 the PSAs. Oh, right, the PSAs. Uh, the PSAs are that you should... Ah, yes. If you are a member of the Patreon, make sure to have right. your address up to date because we will be sending you things if you're at the $10 and above level. But it's really just a good idea to, idea to have that, uh, that up to date anyway because who knows when we might send something. So, mm -hmm. Patreon members... Go update your address. That said, 
If you would like to get things from us and you are not interested in being on the Patreon, or if you just want to get other stuff from us, go to our store at store.loadingreadyrun.com. And if you find something there that you would like to own, but currently is out of stock in your particular size, throw in an email. There's a button there that you can push. That email will go directly to a little hole where we're storing the emails. <laughs> And that hole will be unearthed when we have new product of that size, and you will be alerted to the availability of that particular size, of that particular product, and that is the only thing that your email will be used for in that context. Mm -hmm. So check us out at store.loadingreadyrun.com, and you can find out when you can buy things, or you can just buy things right away. We definitely, won't, are... sorry. Uh -huh. we definitely won't take your email and sell it to Belarusian teenagers. No, we will just... I mean, we just give them give that out as a service. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, Beach, am I missing anything? Oh, I think that's it. Okay, good. Because otherwise, he gets really, <laughs> really <Testing>. angry. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us tonight on Tinker Taylor Solder Fry Bonus Edition. We will see you next time. God, next time is in three days. Good night, everyone. Ever forward. Never, Never learning. learning.